Hello, and welcome to today's talk, um, Saving Lives Around the World. Uh, Mark Bartolini, who is the director of USAID's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, um, is here to speak with us today about some of the uh, humanitarian crises around the world and the role of the US government in providing aid in those countries. Um, some of Mark's work has included uh, efforts in the Middle East and Asia, and Mark is also a grad of UC Berkeley. I'll let him tell you when, um, from the political science uh, and English department. So I'll turn it over to Mark. Welcome. Thanks. Way back when, in 1985. So uh, thanks so much for inviting me today. And I want to thank the organizers at the University Office of Emergency Preparedness and, of course, the political science department, which I remember fondly uh, and proudly from my time here way back when. Uh, in fact, there was a professor I had uh, named Paul Seabury, he's since passed away, who actually got me into this line of work. I did a paper on refugees here, and he happened to know a man named Leo Chern, who had been uh, one of the presidents of the International Rescue Committee back in New York. And uh, that's how I heard about them, and he introduced me to Leo, and one thing led to another, and a few years later I worked for them for over 10 years. So it was. Be nice to your professors and not only uh, teach you things, they may ultimately get you a job. <laughs> it's my fortunate case. Uh, by the way, my father is here tonight and he paid for my whole education too, so I should give him a shout out as well. Thank him. Um, so what I'd like to do today, um, I probably won't take the full hour and a half, but uh, I'll, I'll give you an overview of how the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance works in USAID. And uh, I'll maybe sprinkle some comments through these uh, descriptions of, of some of the crises today. But at the end of the talk, I'll give a little more description of a few of the crises that uh, I've been involved with this year with uh, our large team responding. So the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, well, let me start by saying the administrator of USAID has been designated by the presidency, by the president, as the lead federal agency for uh, overseas disaster assistance. And that authority is delegated down to my office. So we're the lead agency for coordinating the entire US government response in the case of a natural disaster. And when it's a complex emergency, or what we otherwise would call a war in simple terms, um, it's a little more complicated in terms of what agency takes the lead. Uh, but the, I'll call it OFDA, also has the lead for internally displaced people. Those are people who've been driven from their home in conflict or by a natural disaster and uh, have not gone across an international border. And we also have the lead again for IDPs. So in, we're in many conflict areas around the world as well as uh, uh, where natural disasters have occurred. Now our mandate and mission is pretty simple. It's to save lives, to alleviate suffering, and to mitigate the social and economic impacts of disasters. Um, we have criteria for how we'll respond to a disaster. When there's a disaster internationally, the first thing that has to happen is the ambassador of that country needs to issue a disaster declaration. And we also have to be invited in by the host country. That's not always the case, but 95% of the time it is. Uh, and in fact, we work quite closely with the host governments when we're responding. We take a whole of government approach. And what that means is that depending on what the disaster is, we try to draw in whatever federal agency uh, might be uh, technically suitable to respond to that disaster. And I'll give you some descriptions of that in a minute. Uh, we work quite closely with the National Security Council, with the Department of State. Within the Department of State, there's an office, uh, the Population, Refugees, and Migration, and they have the lead on refugees overseas. So in a crisis like you're seeing right now in the Horn of Africa, where you have hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing into um, Kenya and Ethiopia, uh, PRM is quite active in, in those areas, and they also will work inside uh, internally as well. Uh, in addition to, to state and NSC, we work quite closely with the Department of Defense. Um, the Department of Defense brings tremendous logistical capacity to a disaster, to a natural disaster. Uh, they have all sorts of uh, logistical capacity in terms of airplanes, trucks, you name it that simply no other entity can uh, match. So in the early days of a disaster, we're when, when it's available, it's on, most of the time it's not available. When it is available, we will use it if we can. Uh, it can really be life-saving, and I'll give you some examples of that as well. And then we'll work with a variety of other federal agencies, from uh, Health and Human Services to within HHS is Center for Disease Control. Uh, in the Japan uh, disaster earlier this year, uh, 
Uh, it was the first time, as far as I know, my fortunate uh, or unfortunate timing to be there, that the office had ever responded to a nuclear disaster. I received word at around 2 in the morning that there'd been a massive earthquake. I went into the office and saw the, the horrible pictures on the screen. In our op we have an operations center, uh, just the massive uh, tsunami wave. And uh, you know, immediately, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more description in a minute of what we do in a case like that in terms of how we specifically respond. But it wasn't until later that night that I heard there had been a nuclear disaster, and uh, along with the crisis. And we brought in uh, the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So we had some of the world's best experts on our, on our team responding. Um, now, let me give you uh, a, a little bit of the structure of how, we, how the office is, operates. So we have a, a Washington, D.C. team that's comprised of what you would imagine, operations, program staff, grant staff. Uh, we have quite a few technical experts on our staff in Washington. And they go out to the field. They're experts in things such as health, shelter, uh, what we call WASH, which is water, sanitation, and hygiene. Uh, clean water is critical in the aftermath of a disaster. You'll see most people in a disaster will des die not from the disaster, immediate disaster itself, but from disease after a disaster. So it's really critical to quickly intervene. And uh, we do economic livelihoods. Uh, protection is a very big part of our work, and protection is we know, especially when we're working in complex emergencies, but even in natural disasters, that there are vulnerable populations, uh, women and children and others, and protection is a way of mainstreaming that uh, concern into our programming. So for instance, if we set up a camp internally in a country, an IDP camp, we'll try to ensure that there's lighting, uh, provision of fuel for cooking, because women are often, often attacked when they're outside a camp barrier uh, collecting firewood. Um, and that just runs throughout our program, trying to devise strategies that, that protect the most vulnerable in a crisis. Uh, so that's our, our structure. And we also have three warehouses internationally, one in Dubai, one in Miami, and one in uh, Pisa, Italy, where we have stockpiles that we're able to get out usually within 24 to 48 hours anywhere in the world. And these are things like plastic sheeting, although not your normal plastic sheeting, this is really uh, durable sheeting that can last three or four years, uh, to hygiene kits uh, to promote sanitation in a crisis, um, um, to generators, to water purifiers, you name it. We've got quite a bit of stocks uh, that we can deploy quickly. Um, now, when a disaster hits, and I was talking about uh, Japan, to think of what we do, when, I, when we see something on that scale, we know right away that it's, it's going to require a significant response and there was a disaster declaration issued right away. Um, we deploy what we call a DART, a Disaster Assistance Response Team. And that's made up of professionals. Uh, I failed to mention our structure. We also have regional teams throughout the world. Uh, we have, I think, eight right now throughout the world. And we also have country teams that are on ongoing responses. So we'll pull from those teams and send those folks out on the DART along with some of our technical experts from uh, headquarters. And in the case of Japan, we also sent out the staff from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Department of Energy. Uh, and then we also, immediately when we saw how bad the crisis was, we sent out what are called USAR teams, or urban search and rescue teams. And we'll often deploy those in a case of an earthquake, or in this case, where we know that there could be bodies that, that have not been recovered, or, or people that are alive, that's the reason why we send them out, that can be recovered. And the USAR teams um, can deploy in various ways, heavy or light. And in the case of Japan, we sent both our teams. We have contracts with the Los Angeles County Fire Department and the Fairfax, Virginia County Fire Department. And we send them out. They have to go out on 747s because their equipment is so vast. Uh, they went every, with everything from um, water purification equipment to rescue dog teams to uh, boats. They go out with swift water rescue boats and teams that are specially trained to do swift, wa swift water rescue. Um, it's, it's, it goes through a certification uh, process, these teams, and it's actually quite um, uh, strenuous in terms of what they have to do to be internationally certified. They're, they're really incredibly capable folks. And uh, in almost all the crises where we deploy them, they do save lives. So we'll get our, our DART team in the field, and then back in Washington, we'll have what's called a response management team, an RMT, we call it. And that basically are folks that help support that field team. And in the case of Japan, we had experts, again, from those same agencies that we sent out 
Uh, we also had experts from HHS. Um, as I said, this was the first time that we had responded to a nuclear crisis. And as you can imagine, uh, the families of these various folks we have in the field were quite concerned because there was not, uh, um, it's, it's something that is so novel in terms of a disaster that people really didn't understand the threats that their loved ones might be under responding to a crisis like this in terms of radiation. And we were very fortunate to have some of the world's experts right there that I could talk to and get a sense with uh, data that they were able to obtain through their own monitoring and through uh, Japanese officials of where the danger zone was and what the hot area, we call it, the hot zone, what area we could work in and what area we couldn't work in. So I was confident having these folks that where our teams were deployed, it was safe because we did not have the equipment to operate in that kind of an environment. Um, the military does have some capability there, but very few uh, entities can, can operate in that zone. But it was also critical to have these teams out there to help the Japanese government, uh, both with the nuclear response, looking at the technical side of uh, the problems, of which there were many, uh, but also to help look at um, working with the population writ large to describe what the real dangers were. Um, there's quite a number of American servicemen and families in Japan, as well as American citizens, so it was of grave concern to the White House. Um, uh, you know, the disaster was, of course, but also on the, on the welfare of American citizens. So uh, it, it, early on, information was quite slow in flowing in from the Japanese government. So we really had to do all that we could to try to paint a picture of what was actually going on in the Fukushima plant to get a better understanding of, of what the real risk uh, was. Um, now, let me mention a little bit about our partners. So we, we work wholesale. Uh, not retail, meaning that we actually are not implementing programs beyond sending these teams out, they're doing assessments, and then we're a donor, and we fund any number of partners in the field. And those partners are UN agencies, uh, non-governmental organizations, both local ones in the countries where we operate, and also international uh, organizations, uh, other international organizations, um, the International Organization of Migration, ICRC occasionally will fund, it's quite a wide, wide range of organizations that we work with. And uh, then, of course, you can imagine all these agencies. How do you coordinate all that? And that's, that's not an easy task, uh, as we find over and over again. And Haiti was perhaps one of the better examples of that, where there were several thousand non-governmental organizations, many of whom have been there for years, operating in a fairly small space. And coordination is very difficult. But the UN does have a system, and that's the system that we follow. There's an office, the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, UN OCHA, and it's their responsibility to collect information from the various responders and to provide that information to the whole range of responders so we can get situational awareness of what is actually going on. And that, along with resources, are really the two most critical elements of responding to a disaster, knowing what the issues are, what the problems are, who's doing what where, and having the appropriate resources to respond. Um, and let me talk a little bit about resources. So the way it works in the field, the way we'd like to see it work, is that there's a pull from the field. They're telling us what's needed and not a push. And that's a lot easier said than done as well. Um, there's all sorts of uh, pressures from political pressures from various governments to people that just want to do something in the face of the horror they may be watching on their TV screen. And the first impulse, I think, is just, let's send stuff. It's cold there, we'll send blankets or we'll send food. And when you think about it and think about the uh, cost of transporting goods to a place, it just doesn't make sense economically. Moreover, it may not be the right thing. It may not be culturally appropriate. Um, it takes up, uh, it essentially clogs the logistic pipeline that is absolutely essential to function properly in the early days of a crisis if we're going to get the most needed aid to people. So we have a motto at uh, AID that we try to send out to the public and a disaster hits, and that is cash is best. And it sounds a little mercenary, but uh, it really is the case that uh, uh, it is the most appropriate intervention. It also has the added benefit of helping support the local economy because we will buy, our partners will buy supplies locally. And often, oftentimes in the aftermath of disaster, the economy is devastated. So that's something else we're very concerned about is getting an economy up, up and running as quickly as possible. Um, so the phases of a crisis, um, the immediate disaster response is the relief phase, and then you have the recovery phase, and then you have reconstruction, and then ultimately development. And frankly, it's a difficult transition. It's, it's not as linear as one might think. Uh, 
and aid organizations and, and responders have struggled for years uh, from what we call the relief to development continuum. We'll often go in there and get a lot of good programs running. Um, in the initial phase, in the emergency phase, we're simply trying to save lives. But by the recovery phase, we call it early recover, we're starting to build livelihoods, trying to get people's assets, retain those that still have assets, and replenish those who've lost assets. Uh, in a lot of countries who work, uh, less developed countries, livestock is a key issue. And I, I mentioned our technical teams. We also have a veterinarian who specializes in livestock. That's absolutely critical to retaining people's assets. Um, so taking that and then going to the development phase is a real challenge with our community. And we're getting better at it. I was just out in, in Kenya and Ethiopia working on this issue, working with the US missions out there to try to better tie in what we're doing right now in the Horn of Africa to their longer term development goals. Um, but making that, that transition seamless would, would definitely uh, more rapidly um, support those we're trying to help. Um, now let me talk a little bit about uh, sort of the um, environment that we're working in today. We've seen an incredible increase over the last decade of disasters, especially hydrometeorological disasters. <clears throat> Most likely, of course, related to climate change. Um, we are seeing more severe storms and more severe droughts, and, more, and, and quite a more of them. Um, this creates any number of problems. It can create conflict, uh, and especially in the cases of drought where uh, you have conflict over scarce resources, um, and it can create displacement. Uh, there's quite, quite a bit of concern in our field about what's going to happen over the next 10 to 20 years with sea level rise and communities that will be displaced because of that and the pressures that will put on various societies. We're also seeing a much more of an urbanization factor going on where cities are getting larger and in some cases in less developed countries far more dangerous. Uh, in Kathmandu in Nepal, it's considered uh, uh, a very dangerous place because earthquake um, codes simply aren't followed, and uh, structures are, are very much uh, um, vulnerable to earthquakes, and we know that at some point in the future there's going to be a big earthquake in, in Nepal that's going to hit Kathmandu. So there's a lot of effort to try to mitigate disasters. And in fact, when you look at uh, the totality of what we're facing globally and the expectations, uh, predictions of how our, our workload is unfortunately only going to increase, you have to wonder where the resources are going to come from to respond. I'll mention a little bit about our budget issues, which you probably are aware this year is, is pretty grim. Uh, but even beyond the US's own issues, the global community, I think, is, is retrenching a bit in disaster response. There are some new donors coming online, and that's important, and we're doing a lot of work to encourage that. In fact, I'm here in San Francisco in part working on that issue. But uh, I think there's a, a consensus among the disaster response community that one of the most effective things we can engage in today is disaster risk reduction, mitigating the impacts of disasters. Um, this can, any number of things fall under this, uh, this program of, of mitigating disasters. It's everything from taking a community that is susceptible to drought and building small scale water projects to diversifying their incomes or livelihoods from just uh, pastoralists who are working with livestock to doing small scale agriculture products uh, when I was just out in Kenya and Ethiopia, I saw great examples of that. And in a time like this, where you have a severe drought, it's really life-saving activity. But in addition to certain programmatic elements, there's also things like early warning systems. And early warning systems have been absolutely critical to saving lives over the last 20 years. Um, these range in everything from volcano early warning systems, tsunami early, early warning systems, flash floods, hurricanes, uh, disease early warning networks. We have uh, those in play right now in Pakistan uh, due to the flooding there, as well as in the Horn of Africa, um, to drought and famine uh, early warning networks. We knew a year ago that the Horn of Africa, which again I'm going to talk about in some detail in a few minutes, uh, had great potential to suffer a very severe drought this year. Um, we knew that a year ago. About six months ago we were pretty certain it was going to happen. And in fact, right now, it's suffering its worst drought in over 60 years. And the early warning system, it was complicated in the case of Somalia, which I'll, I'll leave it to my discussion about Somalia, in terms of how effective it was. But it was certainly effective in, in Kenya and Ethiopia in terms of getting aid in and, and helping to somewhat mitigate the impacts of the drought. Um, 
In addition to that, I should say that we've been doing long-term development programs in both those countries for decades. And if you travel through both countries today, you'll certainly see major impacts from this drought. But the rainfall totals in areas of both Ethiopia and Kenya have been somewhat commensurate with what they've been in Somalia, yet you're not seeing anything like uh, the level of mortality that you're seeing in Somalia. And in, in, in the main reason is the access issue in Somalia, but it's also because the numbers of people that have been helped through development programs, especially in Ethiopia, even as the population has risen, uh, the numbers in, that are affected by the drought are far less than they were a decade ago in the last major drought. So it does show that development can have very positive impacts. Um, since I'm on the, the horn right now, let me, let me continue on. Um, I mentioned the access issue in Somalia. Um, as I said, we knew early on that this was likely to degenerate into a very serious drought. And to the extent that we could, we've been pre-positioning supplies in the region, even inside Somalia and northern Somalia, which is somewhat accessible, well, is accessible. Uh, but in the south, um, because of conflict resulting from a, a variety of factors, it's simply been too dangerous to uh, efficiently operate down there. There's a group that's listed on the U.S. terrorist watch list, Al-Shabaab, that uh, has been very uh, difficult to work with in terms of, of getting access. In 2008, when the last large-scale number of NGOs were operating in there, in one year, 48 NGO staff were killed. And then the Shabaab expelled many of those organizations, including UN organizations, from operating down there. When it became apparent several months ago that this was going to be a serious drought, um, there was an overture for them to come back, but within a matter of weeks, that was canceled by other factions of Al-Shabaab. And those organizations are still considered to be expelled. Um, there's that, and then there's a fairly weak transitional government that's in place in Mogadishu. Um, you're seeing a lot of uh, internally displaced people fleeing into Mogadishu now and in areas around Mogadishu. And there's a tremendous amount of conflict uh, around those uh, internally displaced people. And there are some or organizations moving back into Mogadishu, but again, because of the risk there, it's been very complicated. We're also seeing um, um, responders from countries that uh, we typically uh, have typically not been as active uh, from Islamic countries getting very involved, which we think is a very good thing. Um, they have better access than we do. They're able to develop relationships. Uh, the U.S. government uh, does not have any relationship right now with Al-Shabaab. So we feel that this is also a promising avenue to try to reach these people. Now, I mentioned these early warning systems, and there's two that are in play right now in Somalia. One is called FuseNet, and the other is FSNAU. Uh, um, and FuseNet uh, looks at climate and makes predictions in terms of uh, where, they where they see uh, conditions going. And FSNAU, and to a degree they both do this, they look at market prices. And you think of a famine and you think, well, there's a lack of water, animals are dying, they're losing their livestock, and crops are withering, they're not able to grow crops. All that's true, but the real problem in a famine are markets. And what's happened in Somalia is you've seen prices go from 100 to 300 percent in increases. And so people simply exhaust their resources trying to buy food. So there's been a lot of research on some of the critical interventions in a famine, and restoring markets is clearly one of them. Now, how do you do that? Um, one way is to incentivize traders to get food in to drive prices down. And we're trying to do that, bring in large quantities of food. You don't want to bring prices down so far that it depresses the market and ruins the economy. And when the country tries to come back, there's no, nothing there to support farmers because that's where most of the economy is based in agriculture. Um, but trying to modulate prices through market interventions with food, also cash. Just getting cash directly into people's hands so that they can start to buy food will also spur traders to start getting food into markets that may not have enough or any. Um, and then there are the standard food programs, which we're also doing, but not in the huge way that we've done them in the past. And the reason, or there are several reasons why we're not doing big, large-scale food programs. One is just the access problems. Two is that because of the conflict, we know that a lot of that food is going to get looted, and that's a problem. And we know also from past uh, responses that there are unintended consequences from providing 
large-scale food. It's very easy to attack convoys of food. Uh, it's easy to loot warehouses. And that becomes a weapon of conflict, that food. It's a commodity that's quite valuable. And we saw back, uh, I'm sure you've all heard of Black Hawk Down, in the Black Hawk Down uh, days of the early 90s drought, where uh, the, the military intervention and the large-scale food program tended to promote a tremendous amount of conflict uh, that in no small part has led to the continued de destabilization of the country. So you have to be very aware of what some of the unintended consequences might be of interventions. The other thing about a drought is that you would think that people die of malnutrition. In reality, most people will die of disease. It's true that malnutrition lowers the body's immune system, and that's what triggers the vulnerability to so much disease. But uh, disease is the number one cause of mortality. And I think every, every crisis has its, uh, its own horrible edge to it, I think. And by far and away, the worst thing about a, a famine, which much of the southern part of Somalia is now in, is that it hits particularly hard on children under five. We know that right now over 30,000 children have died in this famine. And there are es estimates now from FuseNet that 300, I'm sorry, 750,000 people are vulnerable to, uh, to die within the next three to four months if aid doesn't reach them. It's a, it's a sobering statistic. And we also know, uh, you would also think, there's many counterintuitive things in a drought, that when the rains come, things will get better. And it's true that when the rains come, if they're sufficient enough, agriculture can hopefully start again. And we're already looking at, at the planting season. But rains will also bring on new diseases and deadly diseases. Um, children will be dying in large numbers of diarrheal diseases, of waterborne diseases. Um, so it's imperative that we do as much as we can now to vaccinate children. Um, I mentioned the difficulty of providing aid in the Shabab areas. We know right now that only about 20% of the population in Shabab areas is vaccinated. And Shabab is not allowing large-scale vaccination campaigns. There are vaccinations available at local clinics, but they're really a drip and a drab in terms of what's needed to stem the mortality rates. Now, a couple of other aspects of this crisis, along with these horrifying numbers. When I was out there a few weeks ago, I visited, uh, there's, there's large refugee camps on the borders of both Kenya and Ethiopia. And I visited a camp in Ethiopia, I'm sorry, in Kenya along the border called Dadaab. It's the largest refugee camp in the world. Prior to this crisis, I think it had about 330,000. It now has about 450 to 470,000 people in it. Um, it's a small city. And it is one of the most uninhabitable places I think I've ever been. It's incredibly dusty, and even a, a light breeze just blows dust everywhere around the camp. It's, it's not a very pleasant place, uh, just physically, let alone what's happening there. When I was there, there were about 40,000 new arrivals in this camp. These were refugees who had just crossed the border uh, within the last two weeks, and they hadn't yet found a place for them in the camp, which is already well overextended to what its capacity is, should be. And uh, I talked to probably 50 or 60 of these refugees, and their stories were depressingly similar. Many of them, the majority of them, sold their land before they left. Now, back in the 90s, during the, the drought that the US government responded to militarily, when people fled, it was largely due to conflict. So you had sort of a middle class refugee component in these camps in Kenya and Ethiopia. But today, what we're finding is the poorest of the poor. They've exhausted all of their resources. Um, listening to their stories of their sometimes week-long trips through the arid lands of Somalia was, was really horrifying. One group alone that I spoke to, they were, they were traveling in a group of about 300 people. They lost 12 children on that one trip, uh, died along the way. Um, it's an incredibly arduous uh, trip. And when they get to the camp, Many of them are in such bad shape, again, especially the children, that they don't survive. And there are stabilization centers uh, throughout the camp that NGOs are operating. Uh, when I was there, they were completely full. Um, and children weighed, I saw six-month-old children weighing you know, one to two pounds. Uh, it's, it's really horrifying. And many of them, uh, when they come in in that kind of shape, it's very hard to save them. On a more positive note, there's been a lot of advances in terms of responding to drought. And there's been um, um, nutritious 
interventions devised. One is called ready-to-use therapeutic feeding. And essentially what it is, it's a, a peanut-based paste that children are able to, to just ingest. And it doesn't take too much um, um, work with a mother or father in terms of how to administer it appropriately. Um, again, I, I mentioned counterintuitive. I heard uh, when I was out there that there was an interest in getting baby formula in. And if a child is severely malnourished, you don't want to give them baby formula. That's not probably going to do, it's probably going to do a lot of harm. Um, also, along with the issue of baby formula is that uh, there's a real emphasis on promoting breastfeeding because of what it can mean for the health of a child, to improve the health of a child. And tragically, even children who survive being so severely malnourished, they're likely to have the impacts of it for the rest of their life. Their growth is stunted, their intellectual development is stunted. It has a terrible impact on young children. Um, amazingly, this story is not well known, I don't think, in the United States, given uh, the scale. It's certainly the worst crisis, humanitarian crisis, right now in the world. And uh, I think that is for any number of reasons, uh, including, frankly, the media not covering it as they have uh, la such large-scale crises in, in the past. Um, I think in part because of that, USAID is launching a program called Forward, uh, Famine, War, and Drought. And uh, the idea behind this is to educate the American public. There's going to be uh, TV spots. The Ad Council has uh, generously offered free airtime for us on network TV and elsewhere. And uh, there'll be a number of people you probably will recognize uh, um, presenting messages on this. Uh, because as, as bleak as that story is that I just told you, I mentioned Ethiopia and Kenya. And there are areas of those countries where there are also children that are severely malnourished. But they are getting fed. The mortality rates, other than in the camps, are nowhere near what they are in Somalia. And so there is hope with intervention that lives can be saved. Um, so with that, let me turn uh, to, let's see, we can get the time here. We'll go for about another 10 minutes. Let me turn to a couple of other crises this past year. I mentioned uh, DRR and the perilous condition that Kathmandu is in. Uh, in Tokyo, a 9.0 earthquake. That, I think it's the fourth largest earthquake ever recorded. About uh, less than a week after the earthquake occurred, I was in Japan and I flew up uh, with the uh, US ambassador to Sendai uh, and then flew from there via helicopter up the coast. And it was just horrifying to see the impact of the tsunamis. But with that, you did not see the devastation you would expect from a 9.0 earthquake. Um, the resiliency of Japan was really remarkable. And not only um, from the impact of such a massive earthquake, where I, I forget what the numbers were, but I believe it was barely over 100 people, which is a lot of people, but nothing what you, you saw in Haiti, 200,000 people um, died. And, and that, again, is because they had building codes that were enforced and appropriate uh, disaster preparedness procedures in place. Um, but the tsunami, when I was up there, I was given a very interesting briefing by the general who was commanding the Japanese response. And he said, you know, and they, in Japan is without a doubt the most prepared country on earth for a tsunami. They built in gates to protect themselves. They have prepa annual preparedness events with the entire community. Um, but he said, we prepared for a 300 year event and we got hit by a thousand year event. And there's just some things that you really can't prepare for. And I think in Japan's case, that was one to have that kind of a massive wave hit. Not only was it, were the waves, especially in, in some of the uh, channels along the coast, you had waves up to 60 feet. You saw large ships on tops of buildings. It was amazing and horrifying. And, and they were still doing recovery when I was up there. And you know, certainly very difficult for the survivors who were still trying to, to live in the area that the tsunami uh, impacted. But Japan did show, again, the importance of, of resilience of communities and how that can save lives and how important that is. Uh, I was in Indonesia earlier this year, and I went to Mount Merapi, which is a, an active volcano on the island. There, I forget how many there are, but Indonesia is full of them. Indonesia, I think, has almost every disaster you can have. Um, and there had been a, a significant eruption uh, a year ago on Mount Merapi. And we had an early warning volcano system in place. And in past volcanoes, I think it was somewhere in the order of 30,000 people had died. 
In this one, less than 300 died, less than 1% of those evacuated. Again, because there was an early warning system in place. Uh, in Bangladesh, which is one of the most disaster, it is the most disaster prone country on earth, um, there are, there's quite a bit of data on cyclones that struck along its low-lying coast that killed uh, at one point 300,000 people, one point I think it was about 200,000 people, and then there were all sorts of interventions to do disaster risk reduction. And these were everything from developing mangrove buffer areas to working with women who it was discovered often drowned when these hit because they carried their baby with a sari and the way it was tied, they'd get caught on branches and they'd get pulled under and drowned. And so just by explaining a different way to, to carry their child made a difference. And it's this kind of sort of community-based um, preparedness that can have tremendous impacts on saving lives and reducing costs and reducing the economic damage of a crisis. And the economic damage of a crisis uh, there are certainly cases that, that for, it takes years, sometimes decades and generations to recover from. And uh, as horrible as it is to lose your family and friends in, in, uh, in such a situation, the economic consequences again can go on for decades. Um, let me just briefly talk about Libya. So the Arab Spring, that's kept us quite busy this year as well. And uh, in Libya, it was a unique situation in that you had very few organizations that had operated inside <clears throat> prior to uh, the uprising against uh, Colonel Gaddafi. Um, so our strategy there was to get them to fund organizations to get in, to understand what it takes to operate in a country. And that's critical to start learning the culture, learning um, who, start hiring people so that you have a base of people that can respond when a crisis hits. Um, all those elements are absolutely critical. And it, it, it was, I think, very successful in Libya in that we had partners that were working in, there were several besieged areas of Libya in the west up in the Nafusha Mountains and uh, outside uh, in the east uh, in a city called Misrata that was under siege for several months. But our partners were able to get in there and were able to do life-saving health interventions, medical interventions during these times of crises. Um, the situation right now in Libya, uh, it's certainly improving, but it's, there's still areas now under siege from um, transitional national government forces uh, along the coast. With that, why don't I briefly uh, just say a final couple of remarks and then open it up to questions. So it's been a tremendous honor for me to work for uh, the US government doing disaster relief. I think it really expresses the highest ideals of who we are as a country. Um, it's, uh, I can't tell you how many places I travel where Americans are looked upon quite favorably because of um, what we've been able to provide people in their greatest hour of need. Um, it's not to say that it's not without its complications. It certainly is, any human endeavor is. And we are a part of the US government. And there, of course, are bureaucratic issues and political issues. Um, but we strive to the greatest degree possible to provide aid in a needs-based manner. And the staff, I have about 300 staff uh, that work at any one time, full-time staff. And then we have surge staff that we bring in. So that can grow quite a bit. But almost all of them have come out of the non-governmental organization world. And we're very committed to this uh, precept that aid should be needs-based. And the government has been very supportive of that as well. Thankfully, all the agencies that we work with. So I think it's, it's really one of the more um, <clears throat> honorable things that any country can do. Um, having said that, right now we are in dire straits. Um, financially, we're looking at a markup in the House that if it were to be approved by the Senate, would significantly cut our budget. And not just the budget of my office, but of all AID and of the State Department. And the investments that have been made in global health programs, in economic programs, in livelihood programs, um, on and on and on are at risk because of these cuts. Uh, and there's another aspect of it that I don't think is, is fully appreciated by many in the American public, and that is a national security impact of uh, what it is our programs do around the world. Um, I think there's no question that uh, Americans' generosity, their compassion, and the technical capabilities that we bring to bear in these crises have a lasting effect on societies in a very positive way. 
So it's, it's tough times. And uh, it's got me doubly concerned, not only for what we might have to do in terms of scaling back our own operations globally, uh, which ironically, there was a big review with the State Department did and we were supposed to double our efforts over the next few years, but that seems highly unlikely at this point. Um, but the U.S. is really seen as a leader in this front globally. Um, for instance, there's an organization that's based out of Geneva, the Good Humanitarian Donorship Initiative, that takes 38 countries who are the major donors providing humanitarian aid around the world. And there's a set of principles we all ascribe to. And there's a concept of burden sharing, of sharing what each country provides based on its, uh, based on its abilities. And as the U.S. government has been a leader, I think when it lowers its contributions, you're going to see commensurate reductions in other countries. So it's a, it's a very worrisome time, as I mentioned earlier, as disasters start to increase and our budgets start to decrease. And with that, why don't I open it up for questions? Yeah? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Bardinalini. Sure. Uh, you briefly talked about the uh, Somalia and Black Hawk Down event, mm -hmm. and uh, I, it came to my mind that uh, prior to the military intervention, the uh, government had, had uh, mobilized a humanitarian effort, uh, Operation Restore Hope, which proved to be extremely successful, mm -hmm. saving hundreds if not thousands of lives. Um, that was a, a clear case where the government worked with the, the reigning warlord uh, if you will, to provide that aid. And I was wondering why that strategy isn't working or, or perhaps it can't be uh, implemented in the Horn of Africa with the Al Shabaab mm -hmm. group. Well, I think right now we're facing a situation and looking at least bad options. And nobody has the answer as to what is the best way to go. I think on the part of the US government, they've seen that movie before in terms of what happened when they went in. and. Uh, given other commitments around the world, and also given the impact that it had not only in Somalia when the US pulled out, but I think in terms of humanitarian situations around the world. Uh, Black Hawk Down, I was in Bosnia at the time, and there were three years before that crisis ended, and I think in part it was because of this legacy of what was considered a failure in, in, in Somalia. But you're right, it was successful in terms of getting food out. And I have no doubt that if there was a significant intervention today, it would be successful in getting aid in. Uh, but I also believe, and I think many practitioners out there believe, that it would also produce all sorts of other unintended consequences that may in the long term be equally or worse uh, for the Somali people. Um, it's, you know, having said that, as I mentioned, there's 750,000 lives at stake right now, and there's nothing to say that this crisis won't go on for at least another six to nine months. So the numbers could grow far beyond that. So certainly all options are being looked at. And there is a doctrine under humanitarian law, the responsibility to protect. Uh, and I think uh, it's certainly, people are making the case now that in those in territory that Shabab has under its control, it's failing to uh, provide for its own people and people want to invoke to R2P. Uh, but the question is how, how it will be done. Um, you know, on the, on the face of it, it doesn't sound uh, all that complicated, but in reality, it's an incredibly complicated endeavor. And the additional problem is, I mentioned that these 750,000 are at risk in the next three to four months. There's no way, even with AMISOM, the UN uh, peacekeeping contingent there, that you're able to ramp them up or bring in another force within three to four months. Uh, it just doesn't happen that quickly uh, to get a military mobilized like that. Um, it's true that if somebody went in, you know, they could maybe present, prevent the next uh, numbers that might die in this crisis, but at least the 750,000, there has to be something we come up with that's more successful today. One of the problems we're facing is we've done a tremendous amount, we beating the international community. I mentioned a lot of uh, Islamic countries have gotten very involved. Um, but the information has been, because of the complications of insecurity, it's been so hard to get that information we don't, we don't have a good gap analysis of how far we are from meeting the actual needs. We usually would have pretty good information. We have great information on other things in Somalia, but not on that. And that's really the critical missing piece, but we're afraid that we're falling short. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if you can talk about um, USAID and your office's relationships with other countries, the governments mm -hmm. of other countries, the aid organizations of other countries, and how decisions are made on 
who's responsible, who's in charge, mm -hmm. uh, where the funds come from, um, you know, so that so that it's a, a global burden to take care of your right. fellow man, not just an American burden. Well, there there are endless meetings and conferences and opportunities to get together with colleagues and discuss how we're responding to any one crisis. Um, it's it's not usually there's there's sort of a standard. Uh, that's in play in terms of how much donor governments will provide to um, UN appeals. And that's the main per way of funding in a humanitarian crisis. The UN will issue an appeal to cover all of the humanitarian needs that it sees. And then it'll use NGOs as well to do be implementing partners. Um, so there's sort of percentages that are very roughly adhered to, but very roughly, depending on the crisis. Um, but then the other issue is making sure that we're not duplicating efforts. And that's uh, accom accomplished through, I mentioned the coordination structure that UNOCHA provides, but also just from having dialogues with other donors. And we're doing that quite a bit uh, on any given crisis. And, and certainly on uh, the crisis in Somalia right now, there's been a lot of discussion between, I'm um, actually heading off to Geneva this weekend for those kinds of discussions with my counterparts from about uh, 25 different countries. So it's just a matter of, of talking on the phone or meeting in person. Yeah. Uh, so personally, uh, as a director, what what has been the hardest decision you've ever had to make? Uh, well, I think um, the decisions we're making right now on the Horn, uh, in terms of human life, these are the biggest decisions I've had to make, and I've only been uh, in the job for nine months now, and uh, I know that. It, it's going to have incredible consequences for people. Thankfully, I'm not making a decision on my own because then we'd be in real trouble. I have a great team back in uh, Washington, and we're supported by any number of other entities within the U.S. government. So it's not made in a vacuum, but uh, I do have the call uh, on funding. And uh, you know, at, at times, uh, with diminishing resources, it becomes a case of triage. And for instance, right now, we know that there's a very severe flood in Pakistan. It's about a quarter of what last year's was, but it's still severe. But I have to make decisions in terms of how to allocate funds. And those are, those are not easy. But uh, um, and any time that uh, we're working in, in countries, I mentioned Libya, it was very risky at times to have teams in Libya. And uh, we're often sending staff out in, into very difficult situations. And of course, that's a very hard decision to make as well. Wrap it up? Great. Well, thanks for coming, everyone. I appreciate it.